Hello, Fly Tires. Welcome to uh, welcome to Fly Tying Monday uh, without Tim Flagler, thank God. So that um, I'm I'm going to win today because Flagler isn't here. Um, and I think the next time I tie against Tim Flagler, I'm, I'm going to. It's my it's my pick. I'm going to make it one of my own patterns, the Rose and Hopper. So. I kind of had mixed feelings about that because if I lose on my own pattern, that's going to be really embarrassing. But anyway, uh, I've tied a few more than him, so maybe uh, maybe it'll maybe it'll give me a win. Anyway, uh, welcome. Today we're going to tie an emerger pattern, and. Um, I know that a lot of you are interested in emergers. I get a lot of podcast questions about emergers. And um, this is one of my own patterns. It's it's a, a pattern. Phil Monahan, who is producing this today. Sorry, Julie isn't here today, folks. Phil's producing. Phil told me that he caught, he it was his best fly in, back in the 90s in Yellowstone Park. And I didn't even think it was that old, but I guess, it, I guess it's been around for a while. It's a rabbit's, it's a rabbit's foot emerger. And, um, I tie it, I tie it just slightly differently than I, than I did originally, but, uh, it's a pattern that guides come to me all the time telling me it's their, their go-to fly when fish are taking emergers. And when guides, when guides tell you that they have you know, faith in your fly, then, uh, that's pretty, that's pretty flattering. Um, I, I honestly have to tell you that it, it's not, a it's not a, it's not a gimme when you put this fly on. I've had days when it doesn't work as well as other emerger patterns. And one of the things, one of the things I think that you want to do is for certain hatches uh for certain hatches that you see all the time that the fish see all the time you want to have uh several emerger and dry patterns and nymph patterns uh things like the the, the most important ones to me are the little olives that can be anywhere from a you know a size 16 or 18 down to a size 24 and the Sulfur, PMD, pale morning done, pale evening done. The little sulfurs uh, that are so common on trout streams everywhere in the world. Uh, in in the UK, they call them pale wateries. Uh, they're little. They're little uh, yellowish colored flies, sometimes with a tinge of orange or olive, and they'll either have a very light uh, gray wing or a cream wing. And these these flies are so common. And they're often hatches that last for weeks or even months on any given stream. And the fish get used to them and the fish get wise to uh, some standard patterns. So there are times uh, for mayflies like this, especially when you want to have when you want to have multiple emerger patterns. So I'll use this pattern. And then I'll use uh maybe a, a sparkle done, which is kind of a half emerger, half dry deal. And then I might, I'll have something else like an RS2. So I'll have multiple uh, emerger patterns or even a soft tackle tied on a light wire hook. So um, this is just one of, of many, uh, but it, it's one that, it's one that, that works for me um, on a regular basis, works for guides. Uh, it's relatively easy to see on the water. Now, no emerger pattern is going to be really highly visible unless it has uh, like a white or a pink parachute wing. And I think sometimes that turns the fish off when they're eating emergers. They don't want to see anything sticking up too high. Uh, so uh, this has a, a, a low profile wing, but the rabbit's, uh, rabbit's foot uh hair does show up pretty well. It floats pretty well. One of the things, um, one of the things that, uh, that I, that I understand is that, uh, rabbit's feet have become difficult to obtain. I know that the, um, actually the, uh, fulling mill who, who ties the Orvis flies, uh, 
came to me and said, you know, we can get some rabbit's feet. And I said, well, I got a couple dozen, but you need, you need more than that. Uh, so, um, what, what I, what I suggest for a substitute is, um, EP trigger point fiber. And I'll actually show you, uh, what one looks like, uh, tied with EP trigger point fiber. I'm going to put it in the vise here. So that's about, that's about the closest thing uh, to rabbit's foot. That's pretty darn close. And you want to kind of stagger it. You don't want it to be chopped off. You want to trim it or, or stagger it so that it has a, a little bit of a natural taper. Um, that's pretty darn close to rabbit's foot. Who knows? It could be better for this fly than rabbit's foot. Anyway, I am tying this on uh, size 16. Orvis tactical dry fly hook. Uh, it's barbless and it's got a relatively short shank, which is good because then you can tie like, you know, a 18 equivalent on a size 16 hook. It's got a, a it's got a nice wide gape there. And um, you can tie this on any curved hook, but I think you do want a curved hook. So a scud hook, a light wire scud hook will work. Uh, straight shank hook doesn't get quite give you the shape, and it doesn't allow the shuck in the body to kind of hang down in the film uh, because you want to tie it around the bend. So you need a you need you need a, a short shank uh, rounded bend fly uh, that's fairly light wire, and you can fish this fly as a dry, uh, or you can sink it and fish it as uh, just a subsurface nymph. You can even swing this fly uh, in the current uh, like a wet fly. So you can use it various ways. I almost, I almost always use it just as a dry. So I fish it dead drift, a single fly to a specifically rising fish. It's not a fly that you're going to use to prospect the water with, uh, I don't think. Uh, it's, it's not a fly that you're going to fish blind in a bunch of water. It's, it's, a, it's a fly you want to tie on when you see a fish rising to a, to a mayfly. Also works pretty well for a caddis emerger too. Uh, caddis emerger and mayfly emergers don't look that different. So uh, it's a kind of a multi-use fly, but it is something uh, to toss to a rising fish. All right. Do you have any questions? Do you see any difference between the hair from the feet of a cottontail snowshoe hair, jackrabbit, and the per performance of the emerger. You know, I've never, Judd, I've never used cottontail hair. Um, you know, uh, snowshoe rabbit's foot hair is quite different from cottontail or jackrabbit. Um, it probably has some water repellent properties because it's, you know, snowshoe rabbits uh, walk across the top of the snow and uh, they don't want their their paws to get wet or icy. So it probably has some water repellent properties and it has a translucency that kind of has that translucency that, that polar bear has polar bear hair has. So I haven't tried the other uh, types of feet, but it could very well work. I would urge you to experiment with it. All right. Let me see what other questions we have. Phil, are you watching the questions? Looks like we have a lot of people here from all over the world. I'm I am watching, but I am not seeing other questions. But somebody mentioned that your fly is one of his best flies in Austria. Oh wow, in Austria, that's that's pretty cool. That's very flattering. You wow. can see I've used I've used Julia's picture because no one wants to look at me. Yeah, <laughs> we'd rather look at Julia. Thank you, Philip. Okay, let's start tying this sucker. Uh, so I'm going to tie this with 12-0 uh, uh, yellow thread. And the, the cool thing about this fly is you could use it to imitate any, any color mayfly you want. Most mayflies have a, a brownish, tannish nymph shuck. So I don't, I don't vary the, the shuck color, and I don't vary the wing color. I use a natural... Uh, hair's ear for its clothes, or hair's ear, hair's ear, hair's ear 
rabbit's foot hairs. Um, and I just changed the body color. So if you're, you know, if you're imitating a little blue wing olive, you put an olive body on it. And I have imitated mayflies up to as big as a uh, green drake, both eastern and western green drake, March browns, and down as small as a size 20, size 20 sulfur or uh, blue wing olive. I don't go, it's a little bit complicated to go uh, smaller than a size 20 in this fly. And the, uh, the rabbit's foot uh, gets a little coarse for flies smaller than that. But um, yeah, so down to size 20. But any, you know, anything, anything bigger than size 20, most of my tie in 14 to 18. So this one's on a 16. All right, so let's start. There's that Orvis tactical dry fly hook. And I'm going to start my thread somewhere up close to the eye. Start my thread. Oh, I forgot to bring my scissors over. I'm going to need a pair of scissors. And cut my thread. And then I am going to get some sort of sparkle yarn. I like uh, Antron. It has, it has a very special sparkle. Uh, but a lot of people use Zelon. Zelon and Antron are, are fairly similar fibers. You could probably use any kind of uh, semi-translucent, sparkly, synthetic yarn. And one strand is way too much for this fly. So I'm going to take not too many fibers. It's easy to overdo. Uh, the shuck on this. You don't want it too heavy. And what I like to do is kind of just fuzz this up a little bit with my fingers so that the fibers aren't so straight because you want it to look like a shuck that's hanging off the back of this fly. So I've fuzzed those up. And then I'm going to attach this to the hook just tie it on top wind back pull it a little bit towards you and a little bit up and then i'm going to go down around the bend so that the that shuck hangs down into the surface film right about there that's why you want to that's why you want a curved hook on this. And then I'm going to cut that off. Pretty short, a uh, little bit less than a shank length, like that. And you can taper it a little bit if you want to get a little bit more natural shape. I don't, I don't know if it's that important, but you can just trim in there a little bit and taper it. And then cut off this, this piece. And then you can use that for your next three or four flies. Okay, questions so far? No? Okay. And- uh, Hold on, Tom. Just okay. one, one, one person asked, um, what exactly is Antron? Antron is a synthetic fiber. Uh, I believe it's a, it may be in the nylon family, but it was developed for uh, stain resistant carpets. So it has some, it has, it, it supposedly has a trilobal structure, which allows it to reflect light. That's what Gary LaFontaine talked about when he first started using Antron yarn for his uh, caddis emerges. That's all I know, but it's sold in nearly any fly shop, Antron or Zelon, any, any fly shop, any online place like uh, fly fish food is going to have both Antron yarn and, uh, and Zelon. And I don't know what Zelon is, uh, 
John Betts found Zelon inside a shoelace of a hiking boot. That's where he came uh, came upon that material. And God knows what it is. But <laughs> anyways, they're synthetic fibers. And then for the body of this fly, I really like Spectre Blend dry fly dubbing because particularly in the smaller flies, I can dub a really tight body with this. And I'm going to use the color that Orvis calls Pale Morning Done, which is a kind of a, a olivey yellow. And you can, you can mix or match this uh, to whatever mayflies you see. Here's a kind of a, here's one that I made up before uh, for uh, bluing olives. That's a mixture of olive and brown. I stuck that on top of the olive. And so I'm just I'm just going to take a, a a bit of this, and I'm going to dub it to my thread. And this stuff is really wonderful to dub, very easy to dub. And I'm going to start with just a bare wisp of this stuff. If you can see it there, yeah. so it's it's really there's really not much there at all. And that first one is a little thick, so I'm going to push it down, and I'm going to come up. I'm having trouble getting in by the camera here. I'm going to put a little bit before that, and then just a little bit more. And dub this really tight. The secret to, the secret to dubbing this stuff, or any dubbing, is to go in one direction only apply lots of pressure lots and lots and lots of pressure as as much pressure as you can put between your thumb and your forefinger and then i'm gonna wind the thread a little bit until the dubbing noodle starts which is right about here you just kind of hold that shuck out of the way and then form a nice tight body with a slight taper to it. And I don't have quite enough. I'm gonna add just a pinch of that. I don't need much more, but I want a little, just a little bit more dubbing. And that's a nice thing about dubbing. You can either you can either add some, you can subtract some by picking at it with your finger. And once you tie a couple flies in a particular size, you'll be able to gauge it. So you want to come up to about a third of the way back on the shank with that body. And then I'm going to go forward to the eye just to cover that shank with thread uh, so that when I tie my rabbit's foot wing in, I'm going to have a, a thread base to secure it to. Okay, Philip, any more questions? Yes, sir. Um, where can you get that dubbing uh, assortment thing you've got? Uh, is that available on the web? Yep. It's at this place called Up to the Orvises, which is- Excellent. Well, um, Joe was mentioning oh, that it, uh, his local store doesn't carry it. So- I Oh, yeah, sure you can get it. You can get it on the Orvis website. Up to the Orvises, as the old Vermonters used to say it about Orvis. You work up to the Orvises? All right, now I got a rabbit's foot. And um, if you have multiple rabbit's feet for these small flies, you want to find one with kind of consistent, fine hairs. And it is um, just like deer hair or anything else, um, sometimes it's tough. And I usually like to take the hairs from the toe, although sometimes the heel will have the finer, more even fibers. This one has kind of fine, even fibers all the way up through it. I think I'm going to take this from the heel today. So I'm going to, I'm going to separate a little bit more than I think I need and cut it off. 
And I, I give it a gentle, uh, just a gentle uh, pull. I like some body in this, so I don't want to remove all the guard hairs when I use rabbit's foot. And then I'm going to come in and I'm going to pull any super long fibers out of there so that I have kind of a uniform, uniform bunch. That might be too much. No, I think that'll work on this. So, yeah, that's about right. It's a little, this is a little heavy, but it's about right. And I don't want that, you don't want that any longer than, than, the, and than the body. So you want it to be just about even with the body. And then secure that to the top of the hook with a couple of very tight turns, holding your index finger on the far side to keep it from sliding over. So you get that kind of the low, low wing. Take about three tight turns, come in with a pair of fine pointed scissors and cut it off behind the eye, trim if necessary. And then bind that down all the way forward so that wing doesn't come out when you're fishing it. And then come back to the base of the wing. Now, I like to put CDC fibers on either side of this fly. I used to put just a CDC beard uh, on it. I just would tie some CDC underneath the um, underneath the the wing on the on the bottom side of the hook, and I found that that would make the fly tip over sometimes. So by putting kind of outriggers of CDC on either side, uh, it, it helps pinion the fly in the surface film and hold it at the right orientation. Not that emergers are always going to be perfectly positioned in the surface film. I mean, they get knocked over and bunged up and everything else. Um, so it's not that important. And the best way to deal with CDC to find the right stuff is just to put a bunch on the table. Sometimes I'll use a little petri dish or a little container to keep it from blowing all over the place and i'm going to look for a couple of fairly full not too big cdc feathers those two there look pretty good and i'm going to take my first cdc feather and I'm going to kind of preen it together. And then you notice that they have a curve. CDC feathers have a little curve to them. I want the curve to go out. This is going to help hold that CDC off to the side. And I tie it in long. I capture it with my thread. Two light turns only at this point. And then I'll position it. I'll kind of pull on it to pull it down. And then what I'll do is I will pull straight up on the butt and pull on that feather until it's about half the length of the wing. So... Yeah, right about there. Maybe I'll pull a little more. And then take one turn only forward to lock that in place. Tight turn this time after those two soft turns. And then I like to turn it on its side to do the far side. And I'm going to take my second feather and tie that in on the far side cupped outwards and again i'll take two soft turns with the thread and i'll pull straight up 
and kind of just work that into position. So what you're going to have is two little outriggers and you can look at it and see if they're even. I'm going to pull it a little bit more. Sometimes you pull it all the way out and you got to start over again. No big deal. Yeah, those look pretty close. And now I'm going to hold them in place and take three really hard turns forward to lock those in place. And you can come in with your sharp pointed scissors, cut them off. Stuff out of the hook. I'm going to lighten this up just a little bit here. It looked a little dark. There we go. And refocus so you can see it better. There, how's that? And then I just like to come forward to capture those and then come back to the base of the wing. Don't wind over those uh, CDC feathers. And now I'm going to put my CDC away. And pull out my hair's ear fur. Hair's ear fur the made up. You can use a commercial blend, uh, probably light hair's ear on this. Any fur, you know, you could actually, you could actually, if you wanted to, use the body the uh, the yellow stuff that you the yellow uh, specter blend dry fly dubbing that you used for the for the body but i like hair's ear on the front of it uh, it kind of imitates uh the the fuzziness of the head and if you look if if you look at these flies uh from underneath if you look at emerging mayfly they they have this kind of uh bubble around their shoulders they get really they get really wide around the around the shoulders where the wings are emerging and there's a lot of movement in there uh, when that wing is first coming out and so the hairs of your head combined with the cdc gives you that sense of a bulk uh, up near the head of the fly and keeps the the rear part of the fly where the, the abdomen is clean and and sparse so um you know if you ever get a chance to to look at a video of an emerging mayfly or you're actually underwater with a with a uh, snorkel and you look up to watch some mayflies emerging you'll see that they they have this this fuzziness this bulk uh around the, the thorax area so i'm just gonna take a tiny bit of that hair's ear dubbing just just barely a, a finger just barely get my fingertips dirty with it and spin that on there nice and tight and then wind that on and i think this helps it float too so now you've got that little bit of a fuzzy head on there when you whip finish and uh, put on a bunch of head cement or not a bunch a drop of head cement and you're done for small flies like this i like the water-based head cement it uh water-based head cement I'll actually get some water-based head cement is very uh, fluid and it tends to, um, I think it tends to, this is the water-based head cement. Uh, it, it tends to flow back into the materials on a small dry fly like this and it doesn't, doesn't clog the eye of the hook. 
And if it does, it's very simple to poke it out. So I'm just gonna brace myself here and just put a little drop there. And that will secure my fly. So that's it. That is the, give you a closer look at it here. Adjust my. That is the CDC rabbit's foot emerger. And as you can see, as I, as I was talking to you, uh, it's got that, that bulkiness under the thorax around the shoulders that uh, that looks like a, an emerging mayfly from underneath. And it's all about two things. It's all about how it looks from underneath, how it hangs in the surface film with that shuck uh, hanging down. And also it's all about an emerging wing. And th that emerging wing is, is, uh, is almost for you. It's, it's so that you, you can see uh, some, you can see this thing on the water, even though it's floating down low in the surface film, that wing sticks up a little bit and it allows you to keep an eye on your, on your fly as it's, uh, as it's floating. And typically, uh, I will, uh, probably you want to know about fly floating on this cause we do use this as, as a dry. What I'll do is, is add some dry fly dust uh, just to the front of it. You don't want to put, you don't want to put any uh, gel floating on this fly. So liquid floating will work okay, but the dust, just take a, just take your, your dust and dust the front of the fly and leave the back untreated so that it hangs down in the film. And that is the hair's ear, or the <laughs> hair's ear, I keep saying hair's ear, rabbit's foot, CDC, rabbit's foot, uh, PMD emerger, sulfa emerger, pale evening done, pale morning done, cream, little cream colored flies, pale wateries if you're in the UK. And Roger, sorry, you're trying to juggle five things at once, but this, this, uh, these all go in the archives on YouTube under uh, Tying with Tom. Um, so we've got them back almost to when we started during the beginning of COVID. Okay, Tommy, you got a bunch of uh, comments and questions. Okay. Cat Catskills legend Bruce Concourse there uh, says he likes to crack the rabbit's foot long ways to get deeper to the base of the hair fibers. Yeah, that that's a that's a great thing to do, and I usually do that. Is is um, you you crack them, and then you have to be really careful because they have sharp nails inside there. <laughs> you have to be you have to be really careful to crack it and then cut it with a pair of tin snips or or your wire cutters or something because um, it is tough to split. But yeah, cracking open those rabbit's feet allows you to get to those fibers easier. Yeah, good, very good point. And uh, I think Treg might have shown up late because you answered this, but maybe you could answer it again. What you would substitute for the rabbit's foot? Uh, yeah, uh, I would substitute uh, EP trigger point fiber. Floats pretty well. It has a similar uh, uh, translucency and similar fiber uh, diameter to the rabbit's foot. And rabbit's foot is getting tough to tough to obtain. Um, Mark wants to know, would you use snowshoe rabbit dubbing or are there too many guard hairs? I do use the dubbing on a fly called the Eccatus, which I think I tied a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah, I, I use the under for it's it's a gray, grayish color. And but yeah, you wouldn't I do. like it for this pattern. Pardon? You mm. wouldn't like it for this pattern. Well, you could if you wanted a grayish colored fly. Uh, I'm imitating a, a pale evening done pale morning done here, which has very distinct yellowish, yellowish orange, yellowish olive, or just pale yellow body. 
so I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use it for this that fly. But if there was a you know for darker flies, yeah, I'd try it. Absolutely. And our friend Judd Cherry uh, mentioned that the best way he knows how to find snowshoe hair feet is to Google beagle breeders or trainers in your area. They usually have some feet. Oh, yeah. Well, you got to ask them before the season. That's where I get all my rabbits feet. Jody Frederick, who works on our office, her husband's a rabbit hunter. And one season, he saved me all his rabbits feet. And that'll last probably last me the rest of my life. So. Uh, yeah, if, if you know a rabbit hunter, um, be good to him. You know, a bottle of booze, a bunch of chocolate bars, something like that in exchange for some rabbit's feet or cold, hard cash. Uh, you know, if you live in the northern climate where snowshoe rabbits are common, and that's a good idea to look at the beagle clubs, yeah. Uh, Dry Fly Fisher 11 asks do you change up the dubbing on the front of the fly for each type of emerger i don't i just put hairs here on all of them but you could you could if you wanted to you know you if you wanted to get really tricky you could make half the body the color of the nymph and half the body the color of the dun to imitate that because you know these these uh, uh cream colored flies have a either a rusty or a dark brown nymph and so you could make the body half and half, the back end uh, to imitate the nymph and the front to imitate the the uh, the dun. But, you know, fish see emergers in all different stages. You know, it's not this one, it's not this one distinct stage. stage. They see the nymphs that have just come up the top. They see it where the, where the wing is just split. They see it where the, the, the mayfly is half out of the, you know, quarter out of the body, half out of the body, three quarters out of the body, and then sometimes fully emerge with the shuck hanging behind it. They see all these stages uh, because the flies don't, you know, the flies don't all do the same thing at the same time. Um, so you could, you could, you could experiment with that for sure. Yeah. Uh, Joe wants to know when in the season would be a good time to fish this pattern. Whenever mayflies are hatching. It's a and, and, or caddis flies, as I said, I use this for a caddis emerger. But this particular one with the yellow body uh, would be any time from uh, mid May to September in the eastern United States, and any time from probably early June through the summer. Um, in the western United States, the higher in altitude you go, the later you're going to see these uh, PMDs. Uh, but right now, it it's this is a prime time in the western United States, and uh, the other place you see a ton of them is on eastern tailwaters like the the Delaware River and the uh, South Holston. This this fly is very very common in tailwaters. Uh, a more general question from Greg, who says, the only trout I have access to are stocked trout in a local spillway. Do they need to be fished for the same way as wild trout? Uh, depends on how long they've been in the stream. You know, when they first when they first get dumped in, they're really kind of dumb and they sample everything. Uh, but uh, in, in many rivers, uh, hatchery fish quickly get acclimated to the natural food source after you know a few weeks um, they start to they start to get picky and i have a theory that that hatchery fish uh, actually get more selective uh during a hatch than wild fish because wild fish are constantly sampling different things they have to in order to survive hatchery fish we have trained them uh, by pellet feeding them for the first six months or a year or two years of their life, we have trained hatchery fish to be selective. You know, at first they were selective to the pellets. That's all they ate. So we've actually trained them to be selective. And I, I suspect that, that hatchery fish can get pretty picky about what they eat once they've been in a river for a while. I know, you know, rivers like the, you know, the one I can think of in particular is the Farmington or the Swift here in the Northeast, 
um, those fish get, those are hatchery fish and they get really, really picky. Now there are some wild fish in the Farmington as well, but a lot of the fish are hatchery fish and they get super, super selective. So I think, again, I think we've trained hatchery fish to be selective by the way we raise them. I think that's it for questions. Okay. What's even Elmer Fudd? <laughs> well, I want to thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in today. Um, appreciate uh, appreciate you, you coming in and asking some great questions. You know, that's what, that's what makes these great are, are the questions that you ask, because I'm sure a lot of the people uh, watching and listening have the same questions. So um, thank you for the questions. If you're new to our Monday tying sessions, um, welcome. We like to have fun here, and it's okay to tease me. Uh, certainly, uh, Tim Flagler and I, when we have our contests once a month, tease each other. And let's see, do we have a fly Monday? I have to take a Monday off. i got to check here. Hang on a second. Let me just check something here on my schedule. Yes. Next Monday... We are going to tie a double trico spinner. So it's it's trico time, almost August. Tricos are hatching throughout the country. It's a little tiny mayfly. And uh, this is a double spinner so that you can you put two spinners on one hook because sometimes they clump together and uh, you can get away with a size 16 or 18 hook instead of a 22 or a 24. So we're going to tie a double trico spinner. Uh, which is appropriate for the season. The following week, I am going to be uh, not available because we're shooting some new casting videos with Pete Kutzer, which is exciting. New, new basic beginner casting videos, which you'll probably see later in the year. And then the following Monday, it's a tie-off with Tim Flagler. We're going to tie the Rosenhopper. So uh, anyway, that's what's coming up. And uh, I want to thank you all for, for being here today. And uh, we appreciate your support. And good tying and good fishing and enjoy the summer.